Ladies and gentlemen, tonight in Miami, Florida, a group of men are gathered together for their annual conference. For their day-in, day-out service to the public, Dragnet honors the 58th annual conference of the International Association of Chiefs of Police. The story you're about to hear is true. The names have been changed to protect the innocent. Fatima Cigarettes, best of all king-size cigarettes, brings you Dragnet. You're a detective sergeant. You're assigned a homicide detail. A wealthy retired businessman suddenly disappears. You've got two possibilities to work on. Suspicion of suicide, suspicion of foul play. There's no lead to the man's whereabouts. Your job? Find him. The latest Fatima sales report shows thousands and thousands of king-size cigarette smokers are switching to Fatima. More and more smokers coast to coast are finding in Fatima. The difference is quality. You see, Fatima contains the finest domestic and Turkish tobaccos superbly blended. And Fatima is extra mild, with a much different, much better flavor and aroma. You'll find Fatima gives you all the advantages of extra length, plus Fatima quality, which no other king-size cigarette has. Fatima, best of all king-size cigarettes. Definitely the best quality in its class, but the same price as the cigarette you're now smoking. Next time, insist on the best. Buy king-size Fatima in the distinctive golden yellow package. Dragnet, the documented drama of an actual crime. For the next 30 minutes, in cooperation with the Los Angeles Police Department, you will travel step by step on the side of the law through an actual case transcribed from official police files. From beginning to end, from crime to punishment, Dragnet is the story of your police force in action. It was Wednesday, February 6th. It was cold in Los Angeles. We were working the day watch out of homicide detail. My partner's Ben Romero. The boss is Thad Brown, chief of detectives. My name's Friday. I was on the way back from the record bureau, and it was 11.18 a.m. when I got to room 42. Homicide. Joe? Hi. Did she show up yet? Yeah, a couple of minutes ago. She's waiting for us now in the next room. Mm-hmm. Did you talk to her at all? No. Seems to be a nice enough woman. I don't know how much help she's going to be. Yeah. Go ahead. Yeah, thank you. Miss Bannon, I'd like to have you meet my partner, Sergeant Friday. Joe, this is Miss Bannon. Hello. I'm sorry I wasn't home when you stopped by yesterday, Sergeant. I got the card you left, though. I called in as soon as I got home. Well, thanks for coming in, Miss Banner. We have a few questions we'd like to ask you. It won't take very long. Right. We have a communication from a Gladys Dillon back in New York, Miss Banner. It's about her brother, a Chester Dillon. We understand you rented his home from him out on Rolston Avenue. Mr. Dillon? Well, yes, I've got a two-year lease on the house. I rented it from him last November. Well, according to the letter we got from Mr. Dillon's sister, she's worried about him. She hasn't heard from him in some time. Have you any idea where we could contact him? Well, the last I heard, he left on a trip to New York. That was about eight weeks ago, I'd say. Uh-huh. You see, I usually sent a check for the rent to the apartment he had here, and when he left on his trip, he told me to hold on to the rent checks, and he'd collect them when he got back. How long did he say he'd be gone? I don't remember definitely. I think he said four or five months. He didn't leave any forwarding address, any place you could contact him back east? No, he didn't. He just wanted to get away. Didn't want to be bothered with anyone. He wasn't feeling very well. He was very depressed, poor man. Well, why was that, ma'am? Do you know? Well, his wife died just a few months ago, you know. No, ma'am, we didn't know. All we got from his sister was that she hadn't heard from Dylan. She was worrying. She didn't give us any other information. Oh, yes, Mrs. Dillon died in last September, I think it was. Poor man felt terrible about it. Couldn't seem to get over it. That's why he rented the house to me. Reminded him too much of her. Yes, ma'am, I understand. Lovely home they have. Mr. Dillon said he really didn't want to rent it, but he couldn't stand being alone in the house. It was a large place, you know. Yes, ma'am. We checked with the people living in the house now. We understand you leased the place to them last month. I right? subleased it, yes. You oh. see, it just got too big for me. It was nice at first, but it got to be an awful lot of work. I rented it to this family and took a smaller house down the street. Would you happen to know any of Mr. Dillon's friends in the city, Miss Banner? Anyone we could contact who might know where we can locate him? No, I don't know. He didn't seem to have any friends. He and his wife had only been in the city a year before she died. He was retired, you know. Yes, ma'am. We talked to some of the neighbors out there. They couldn't tell us much about him. 
Maybe some of the people he did business with might know something. Have you tried the neighborhood bank out there? I know that's where Mr. Dillon had his account. No, ma'am, we haven't yet. Well, I can give you the bank's address. That's about all, though. That's the only contact you know of? I'm afraid so, yes. I didn't know much about Mr. Dillon's private affairs. Whenever I talked to him, it seemed the only thing he had on his mind was his wife's death. Just couldn't seem to get over it. it. Seemed like he didn't want to get over it. You mentioned that when you leased his home, Mr. Dillon took an apartment. Do you happen to have that address, Miss Fanny? Well, I don't have it with me now, but I have it at home. I can call in and give it to you if you like. If you would, please. Well, certainly. Well, thank you very much, Miss Banner. You have our card. When you hear anything at all from Mr. Dillon, we'd appreciate it if you'd call. And surely, I'll call you right away. You think something could have happened to him? Well, it's possible. We don't know. All we have is a letter from his sister. It does seem kind of strange, doesn't it? I wasn't feeling too well. I wondered why he hadn't contacted me about sending the rent money to him. He was such a nice man, Mr. Dillon. I certainly hope nothing's happened to him. Well, you say he was very depressed about his wife's death, ma'am. Would you say that it was getting to be a little abnormal with him, maybe? Well, I wouldn't know about that, Sergeant, but I do know he brooded about it all the time. He felt that he'd lost everything. It didn't seem to want to go on. Mm-hmm. Did he ever give an indication that maybe he might take his own life? I mean, all this brooding over his wife? Well, no, nothing definite. Just depressed and moody all the time. Oh, now that I remember it, the last time I saw him, he did say something kind of funny. Yes, ma'am. What was that? It was the day before he left. We were talking about the rent money, and I asked him if I couldn't send it to him. He got kind of a strange look on his face. Yeah. He said, where I'm going, I won't need the money. The day before we called on Lucille Banner for an interview, a letter had been received from a Miss Gladys Dillon in Elmira, New York. Her request was routine. It was one of thousands of similar letters received every year by police departments all over the country. Each one of them has to be worked out to the satisfaction of all parties concerned, the person who's reported missing and the person looking for them. It's an enormous job requiring thousands of man hours annually. Like the dozens of other investigations handled by the police officer, some of them end happily, some of them in tragedy. Whatever the result, the finding of a lost person is just as important a function of your local police department as any other investigation. Gladys Dillon hadn't heard from her brother recently. She was worried about him. She asked us to investigate. Our initial interview with Lucille Banner, the woman who'd rented Chester Dillon's home, failed to yield much of a lead as to his whereabouts. The only source of additional information she could offer was the neighborhood bank where Dillon had his account. One o'clock that afternoon, Ben and I drove out to interview the manager of the bank, a Mr. Harrison. Yes, that's right. Mr. Dillon's had his account with us ever since he came to Los Angeles. I know him quite well. Is there something you'd like to know about him? Yes, sir, there is. We had a request from his sister in New York. She'd like to locate him. Well, I'm pretty sure his account's still open here. Matter of fact, I'm positive it is. This moment, I'll have one of the clerks get his file. All right, thank you, Mr. Harrison. Hey, that reminds me, I almost forgot. Yeah, what's that? I've got to get to the bank tomorrow for sure. Payment on my car's a day past due already. Only got two maybelins left. Oh, yeah, you're doing fine. I got another eight months to go. Not so fine. Two more payments to go, and now the wife wants a new one. Never fail. Yeah. Here we are, Sergeant, just as I thought. Mr. Dillon's account is still open. Uh huh. Have there been any recent deposits or withdrawals on the account? Let's have a look here. Uh-huh. Just as I thought, nothing since he left on his trip. That last withdrawal date was November 27th. He mentioned to you that he was going on a trip, did he? Yes, I think he said he was going back to New York. More or less a vacation trip. His wife died recently. He didn't take it too well. Yes, we understand. Did he leave any instructions about his account with you, Mr. Harrison? Any address you could contact him at if you had to? No, he didn't leave any instructions with me. No address. Just a vacation trip. He said he didn't expect to be gone too long. Did he mention how long it would be? Five or six weeks, I think that's what he said. I happened to talk to him about it because at the time he made quite a sizable withdrawal. I thought maybe he was a little unhappy with our service. Mm -hmm. How much was the withdrawal, sir? Let's see. Here it is, November 27th. He withdrew $2,400. Was that in cash or in Travis checks? Do you know that? Mm-hmm. Well, it shows here that it was in cash. Mr. Harrison, you said a minute ago that you knew Mr. Dillon pretty well. Yes, that's right. He used to stop and chat with me whenever he'd come in the bank. That was usually once a week. I didn't know him socially, though. Mm-hmm. And you mentioned he seemed to take his wife's death pretty hard. Uh, what would you say his mental condition was the last time so on? All right, I'd say. Just after his wife's death, he wasn't in very good shape. Brooded about it quite a bit. Then he began to pull out of it. Seemed to be in a fairly good frame of mind. Planned his vacation. He was looking forward to it. I see. 
Why do you ask? Is something wrong? No, sir, not that we know of. Routine check, that's about the size of it. Does Dylan have any other real estate besides the house on Ralston Avenue? Would you happen to know that? Mm, not to my knowledge, no. He has no other business connections in Los Angeles. Here are all his references right here. Mm-hmm. See, most of them are charge accounts and so forth. I remember the time he opened his account with us, he told me he was retired. He and his wife came out here for their help. Do they have any relatives out here? Do you know, Mr. Harrison? No. From what I understand, both of their families are in the East. They don't have any children, according to his application. Very few relatives. Mm -hmm. And since Dylan was in here last November to make that withdrawal, you've had no communications from him at all, have you? No, sir, I haven't. What seems to be the trouble? Do you have an idea something might be wrong? Mm, Nothing definite, no, sir. We've been told about his feeling depressed over his wife's death, and there was some indication he might possibly have done away with himself. After what you've told us, it doesn't seem too likely. I don't know. I wouldn't like to commit myself. As I say, he did seem to be getting over it. I didn't know him that well, though. It might be entirely possible. He was devoted to Mrs. Dillon. Maybe he could have taken his own life. I don't know. Well, it leaves a big question to answer, doesn't it? What's that? Why do you need the $2,400 to do it? <laughs> 1.25 p.m. We continued interviewing the bank manager, Mr. Harrison, but he was unable to come up with any further leads. Before we left the bank, he gave us a complete list of all of Chester Dillon's references. We gave him our card, and he told us he would pass along immediately any information he might get on the whereabouts of Mr. Dillon. 1.45. We went back to the office where we got a call from Lucille Banner. She gave us Dillon's last known address, and we drove out to check it. It was an apartment court in the Pico Crenshaw area. We talked to the manager, and she told us that Dylan had moved out three months before, on November 22nd. He told her that he was moving in with a close friend of his, and he gave her his forwarding address. It turned out to be a single-story frame cottage located in one of the older residential districts of the city. The name on the mailbox read Raymond L. Schaefer. We rang the bell, and a man who identified himself as Raymond Schaefer ushered us into a small living room. He told us that he was from the same town in the east that the Dillons came from and that he was a longtime friend of theirs. No, I haven't seen Chester for months. Last November, I think it was. That was the last time I saw him. You say at that time Dillon was living in the apartment down in the Crenshaw area, Mr. Schaefer. Yeah, that's right. You mean he never came here to live with you? No, it's just like I told you before. He talked about moving in here with me, but he never did. I haven't any idea where he is. Well, he gave your name here as a forwarding address, Schaefer. Have you been getting his mail? Yeah, matter of fact, I have. He told me he was going to do that. Never came to pick it up, though. Seemed funny to me. You're still getting his mail here, is that right? Yeah, it's still coming. Not much of it. Maybe a letter a week. Mostly bills and advertising. Mm-hmm. This list of names you've given us, sir, these are all the people in the East Mr. Dillon was acquainted with, people he might contact on his trip back there, is that right? That's all of them. As far as I know, he hadn't been back there yet, though. How do you know that? I got a letter from my sister, Gert, a couple of days ago. If Chester was in town, Gert would have known about it. He would have been sure to stop by and see her. I wish I could help you. To tell you the truth, I'm getting a little worried about him myself. Well, just have one more question, Mr. Shaver. Do you know if Mr. Dillon was in the habit of carrying large sums of money around with him? No, I don't think so. Chester was pretty cautious that way. He wasn't too free with a dollar, you know. Would you happen to know if he had a large sum of money with him the last time you saw him? No, if he did have, he didn't mention it. I see. And you can't think of anything else that might give us a lead on Mr. Dillon's whereabouts, anything at all? I think I've told you everything. I wish there was something I could tell you that it helped. I sure hope nothing's happened to him. Yes, sir. Now, would you mind showing us that mail you're holding for Dylan, please? Oh, sure, sir. Right over here. It's in the desk. There you are. That's all of it. Mm-hmm. Thank you. Anything, Joe? No, not much. Bills, circulars. Here's one with a New York postmark. Elmira. Probably from his sister. It's another one. Only three days old from the Union Department store. A couple more earlier dates on it. That's about it. Yeah, I'll copy down the return addresses on the line. Okay. Mr. Schaefer. Yeah? This suitcase by the desk here, initials on it. CLD. Yeah? CLD. Is that your bag, Schaefer? Oh, no, I forgot to tell you. Chester left that here one day. Hmm? Huh? How was that? Well, that was one day just before he was going to leave on his vacation. Uh, he brought it over here and said he'd like to leave it with me. Forgot to mention it to you. Mm-hmm. Did you bring anything else with him? Yeah, he brought another suitcase with him, just like this one. I got it in the other room. He said he wanted to leave him here while he was on his vacation. I'm sorry I forgot to mention it. Well, maybe you forgot something else, Shaver. What? Most people take their suitcases on a trip, don't they? 
2.30 p.m., we continued questioning Raymond Schaefer. We opened the two suitcases labeled with the initials of Chester Dillon and found an assortment of personal items which Schaefer told us belonged to Dillon and his late wife. Small pictures, cigarette boxes, books, similar articles, which apparently would not be taken on a vacation trip. None of them were of any great value. After we left Schaefer's home, we checked him through R&I and found he had no criminal record. We checked further with friends and acquaintances of both men and found nothing to indicate that Schaefer was in any way involved in the disappearance of Chester Dillon. 3.30 p.m. We called the office and found that there'd been no answer so far to the broadcast and missing persons bulletins that we'd gotten out on Dillon. We started checking the references given us by the bank. First was the Union Department Store. It was located on Main Street in the south end of town. We checked with the credit department to see what information we could get from them. Yes, here's the file on the Dillons right here. Chester L. and Sarah J. On Ralston Avenue. Yes, ma'am, that's the one. What information would you like, sir? Well, we're trying to locate Mr. Dillon, ma'am. Have you had any recent change of address on that account? No, we haven't. If they moved, you know. Well, we believe so. We don't know his present address, though. Hmm. Well, we do have an outstanding bill of theirs, I noticed. Sent them several form letters. We've been trying to contact them ourselves. Have there been any recent charges on that account, do you know? Mm, let's see. Nothing too recent, no. Last charge was made on December 5th. Yes, Thursday, December 5th. Mm. That's a couple of weeks after he disappeared, Joe. Yeah, that's right. What was that charge for, ma'am? What did Mr. Dillon buy? Oh, Mr. Dillon didn't buy anything. I beg your pardon? The slip was signed by Mrs. Dillon. <laughs> Listening to Dragnet, authentic stories of your police force in action. If you smoke king size cigarettes, listen to Fatima's amazing new offer. Buy a pack of Fatimas. Enjoy their extra mildness and superbly blended tobaccos. If you don't like Fatimas better than the king size cigarette you are now smoking, return the pack with the unused Fatimas and we'll give you your money back, plus postage. We make this amazing offer because we believe Fatima is the best of all king-size cigarettes. Smokers all over the country are confirming this every day. Here is the latest state-by-state report. State 1, Fatima sales up 72%. 2, sales up 54%. 3, sales up 107%. 4, sales up 192%. And those are just a few. Remember, if you're not convinced Fatima is better than your present king-size cigarette, just return the pack with the unsmoked Fatimas before December 1st and get your money back plus postage. Fatima, Box 37, New York 1. Buy Fatima. Best of all king-size cigarettes. p.m., Thursday, February 7th. As soon as the clerk in the credit department at the Union Department store showed us the sales slip with the late Mrs. Sarah Dillon signature on it, we had the date on the sales slip double-checked immediately. The date as shown on the slip was correct beyond any doubt, December 5th. That was a little more than two and a half months after Sarah Dillon had died. Who the person was who forged her signature or why they'd forged it, we had no idea. The amount of the charge purchase as shown on the sales slip was for $418, all of it for women's clothing. We attempted to check with the sales girl who handled the purchase, Alora Van Kirk, but we were told it was her day off. We called her home. They told us that she was gone for the day and couldn't be located. They said she'd be at work the following morning. 4.40 p.m., Ben and I took the sales slip with a forged signature on it and drove back to the office. We went directly to forgery detail, briefed them on our findings, and gave them the sales slip. Then we drove back to the home of the Dillon's friend, Raymond Schaefer, and checked through the two suitcases there. We came up with a small photo of Mrs. Dillon along with exemplars of her handwriting as well as her husband's, which we found in an autograph album in one of the suitcases. The handwriting samples were checked against the signature on the sales slip, but neither of them matched. The work of compiling a list of all known female forgery suspects was begun immediately. The following morning, Ben and I went back to the Union Department store where we interviewed the sales girl, Laura Van Kirk, who'd handle the purchase. Yes, I remember making the sale, officer. I'm not too sure about the woman who bought the things, though. I I mean, what she looked like. Well, could you try to describe her for us, Miss Van Kirk, just as well as you can remember? She had light brown hair. I'm pretty sure of that. Not too old. Maybe in her late 30s, early 40s. 
She was a plain-looking woman, five foot five or six, thin as I remember her. She wore glasses. I remember that, too. Let me see. You got that picture of Miss Dillon there, Ben? Uh, oh, yeah. Yeah, here you are. Would you take a look at this picture, Miss? Now, does that look like the woman you waited on? No. No, that's not her. The woman I waited on was much younger. She had light brown hair, too, not gray. Uh-huh. Thin face, I think. And she wore glasses, I'm sure of that. Do you remember if there was a man with her, Miss Van Kirk, or was she alone? No, she was alone. Now that I remember, there was something very different about the glasses she wore. I don't know if that's important or not. What about her glasses? They were horn-rimmed, as I remember, very light color. And there was some metalwork along the top edge of the frame. Very smart-looking. Gold metal all along the top. Light brown hair, slight bill, thin face, late 30s or early 40s. Were light horn-rimmed glasses and gold metal on the frame. Yes, that's right. Check me if I'm wrong, Joe. That description sound familiar? Just what I was thinking. Horn-rimmed glasses, metal work on them. The woman who came to see us at the office? Yeah, you got it. Lucille Banner. Ben and I went back to the office and had Lucille Banner check through R&R. She had no criminal record. Then we drove to the home on Ralston Avenue, which Chester Dillon had leased to Lucille Banner, and which she in turn had sublet. We obtained a copy of the lease which the Banner woman had with the current tenants and which bore her signature. We brought the copy of the lease downtown, gave it to Don Meyer in handwriting, and asked him to compare Lucille Banner's signature with the signature on the sales slip that we'd obtained from the Union Department store. Fifteen minutes later, he called us at the office with the results. Yeah, Don. Mm-hmm. Just so. You're all right. Thanks a lot. What'd he get? Says there's no question in his mind. Yeah. Both signatures match perfectly. <laughs> What the reason was behind Lucille Banner's forging the signature of Mrs. Dillon on the sales slip, we didn't know. Whether or not it had any connection with the disappearance of Chester Dillon, we didn't know. As soon as we got the handwriting report from Don Meyer, Ben and I left the office immediately and drove to the bungalow which the Banner woman was renting on Ralston Avenue. It was a block down the street from the Dillon house. Lucille Banner wasn't at home, but a neighborhood gardener trimming the lawn in front of her house told us that she was expected back shortly. The gardener, who identified himself only as Julio, volunteered that he also did gardening work for Miss Banner when she occupied the Dillon home. He'd also worked for the Dillons when they lived in the house. He told us he liked the Dillons quite a bit, but that he didn't have much use for Miss Banner. He seemed to be up on all the news in the neighborhood. He trimmed the hedges of the lawn with hand shears as we talked to him. Can you tell us anything about Mr. Dillon and Miss Banner, Julio? How they seem to get along, you know? They get along all right, I guess. When I worked at the big house down there for Miss Banner, that's before she moved, I would see Mr. Dillon there. He would be at the house maybe once, two times a week. Miss Banner would ask him to come over and cook dinner for him. Mm-hmm. Miss Banner likes him, I think. Mr. Dillon, I don't know about him. He wasn't feeling so good. Still thinking about his wife. Here, I finish up this clipping now. There, all done. You mentioned you don't like Miss Banner very much, Julio. Why is that? She ever give you a reason not to like her? Yeah, she's a little crazy, I think. Funny woman. When I used to work at the big house for her in the garden, she would watch me all the time, follow me all around, tell me to do all kind of crazy jobs. She gave me good pay, though, so I do them. And how do you mean, Julio? What kind of crazy job? The compost box for fertilizer, you know. She wanted me to build one for her in the backyard. That was down the street at the Dillon house. Mm-hmm. Crazy woman. She wanted me to build a compost box in the greenhouse. Have a special place, Mark. Who ever heard of that? To build a compost box inside a greenhouse. Crazy. Well, did you build it for her? Yes, but not inside the greenhouse. I built it outside, right next door to the greenhouse. When she come outside, she'd go crazy almost. Call me names. Crazy. She made me tear it up. Then she made me build it inside the greenhouse, right on the place she had marked for it. Sounds queer, doesn't it? And, uh, when did all this happen, Julio? Do you remember? When you built the compost box, I mean. A couple of months ago about that. It was just after Mr. Dillon went away. I tried to tell Miss Banner, who ever heard of a compost box in a greenhouse? She wouldn't listen. She had to have it built in a certain place, right in the greenhouse, a little piece of ground in there. The box had to go right on top of it. Uh-huh. You figure she acted pretty strange about it, do you? You think she had something there, a little piece of ground. You think she had something to hide. 1.15 p.m. Lucille Banner returned home, and Ben and I went inside the house with her where we questioned her in the living room. Outside in the front yard, the gardener, Julio, continued working on the lawn. Lucille Banner was calm and composed. We questioned her about the forged signature on the sales slip. 
you would admit nothing. The whole thing's too silly to even comment on. I don't know what you're talking about, Sergeant. We think you do, Miss Brenner. Our handwriting man's checked the two signatures, one on the sales slip and one on the lease. They both match. They were written by the same person. There's no doubt about it. Been checked thoroughly. Now, what about it, Miss Banner? There's no way out of it. You ought to know that. I'll deny it. That's all. I'll keep on denying it. I wasn't in that store, and I didn't forge any signatures. Why would I do a thing like that? What kind of a woman do you think I am? Well, all we know are the facts, ma'am. Now, why don't you give us a straight story? It's going to save time and trouble for everybody concerned. You've heard everything I've got to say. This thing's ridiculous. It's stupid. I'm not answering any more questions. You want to get your hat and coat, Miss Banner? Afraid you're not to come downtown with us. What good's that going to do? I'll just keep on denying it. You can't make me say I did a thing like that. I want to get your coat, please. It's right here. All right. Yes, ma'am. Car's right out in front. Hold it a minute, will you, Ben? Mm, yeah, okay. Julio? Yes, sir. See you in a minute? Sure. Hello, Miss Bonner. Julio? Favor, I'd like to ask of you, Julio. You got a couple minutes to spare? Yeah, you want something? We want to take a look in the backyard of the house down the street. Mr. Dillon's house. I'd like to have you come along with us, Julio. It won't take very long. Sure, okay. I'll come along. And bring a shovel along, will you, Julio? I'd like to check something. Yeah, okay. i bring one. All right. All right, Miss Banner. What's this about? What are you trying to do? Something we want to check in the Dillon's backyard. It won't take long. What would it have to do with me? I don't have anything to do with that house. I don't even live there anymore. You realize that, don't you? Yes, ma'am. We realize it. I'll call my lawyer. I'll call him as soon as I get to a phone. That's right. Julio? Back this way, Sergeant. Through the gate. Uh -huh. What are you trying to do to me? You know I don't live here anymore. I don't even have anything to do with this place. You did live here, ma'am. You lived here when Mr. Dillon disappeared. Isn't that right? What are you trying to say? You've got no business on this property. You've got no business here at all. Yes, ma'am, we have. What? Did you kill Jester Dillon? Did you kill him? Miss Bennett. All right, Julio, the compost box in the greenhouse. Do you want to start digging? In the compost box? Yeah, okay. He was an old man. So old he was sick. Ma'am? He didn't want to live anymore. He didn't have any reason for living. Why shouldn't he give me the house? Why shouldn't I have his money? I was nice to him. I cooked for him. Wanted to take care of him. He just didn't want to live anymore, that's all. All right, Julio, you can hold it up. You want to tell us, ma'am? He needed a woman. Anybody could tell that. He needed me. He got along fine, Chester and me. I offered to marry him, and he wouldn't do it. All he could do was think about his wife. She was dead. He'd sit around and talk about her all the time. You killed him. Is that what you're trying to say? He wanted to marry Chester and take care of him. He wouldn't do it. He had an argument in the kitchen one night. I had a gun, and I killed him. I killed him. Is that where you buried him? In the greenhouse? Yes, I buried him deep. The gun, too. He'll be all right. Poor Chester. Yeah. He was so old. He needed a woman. And he will tell you that. He needed me. Well, I guess you made a mistake. No, Sergeant. He did. Yeah? He didn't want me. The story you have just heard was true. The names were changed to protect the innocent. On June 2nd, trial was held in Superior Court, Department 86, City and County of Los Angeles, State of California. In a moment, the results of that trial. And now here is our star, Jack Webb. Thank you. Friends, during the past couple of years, we've had many talks with law enforcement agencies and received hundreds of letters from police officers all over the country. We're especially pleased to know that so many of these men feel as we do that Fatima is the best of all king-size cigarettes. As a matter of fact, our sales reports prove beyond a doubt that more and more smokers everywhere are switching to Fatima. When you buy your first pack, you'll understand why. You'll enjoy Fatima's extra mildness, their much better flavor and aroma. Next time, look for the golden yellow package and ask for Fatima. Best of all, king size cigarette. <laughs> Lucille Marie Banner was tried and convicted of murder in the first degree. She received the sentence as prescribed by law. She is now serving a life term in the state penitentiary for women, Tehachapi, California. You have just heard Dragnet, a series of authentic cases from official files. 
technical advice comes from the office of Chief of Police, W.H. Parker, Los Angeles Police Department. Fatima Cigarettes, best of all king-size cigarettes, has brought you Dragnet, transcribed from Los Angeles. Stay tuned for Counter Spy next on NBC. Detective Sergeant, you're assigned a traffic investigation, hit-run felony detail. An elderly woman and her nine-year-old grandson are struck down in a pedestrian crosswalk by a speeding truck. The woman is killed instantly. Witnesses fail to get the license number. The hit-run driver escapes. Your job? Find him. Dragnet. The documented drama of an actual crime. For the next 30 minutes, in cooperation with the Los Angeles Police Department, you will travel step by step on the side of the law through an actual case transcribed from official police files. From beginning to end, from crime to punishment, Dragnet is the story of your police force in action. It was Tuesday, December 21st. It was windy in Los Angeles. We were working the night watch out of traffic division, hit and run felony detail. My partner's Ben Romero. The boss is Captain Calfee, Commander AID. My name's Friday. It was 10.51 p.m. when we got to the Carlton Theater, the box office. Thank you. How many, please? Police officers, ma'am. I'd like to talk to you for a minute, if we could. Oh, yes, you mean about the accident? Yes, ma'am. One of the officers in the traffic car across the street, he told us you're one of the people who saw it happen. Yes, that's right. Terrible thing. It was an old lady and a grandson, you know. Yes, ma'am. Would it be possible for you to get a relief for a little while? A few questions we'd like to ask you about it. It won't take very long. Well, I'll be off duty at 11. That's when the box office closes. Eight minutes to 11 now. Would you like to wait? All right, ma'am. Fine. Cold wind out there. Would you like to wait in here? Right around back here, I'll open the door for you. All right, ma'am. Thank you. Yeah, it's nice and warm. Did anybody get the license number? Do you know, officer? I mean, on that truck that ran them down? No, not that we know of. We understand the officers in the traffic car talked to you. You didn't see the number either? No, I'm sorry, I didn't. The whole thing happened so fast. I saw the old lady grab the little boy, pull him next to her. It was an awful thing. The truck hit them both together. It's funny the things you notice. The boy was carrying a little box of candy. I heard this terrible thud when the truck hit them. I looked and the candy was spilled all over the street. I just couldn't help it. I got sick to my stomach. Yes, ma'am, I can understand. Now, about this truck that ran them down, do you think you'd know it if you ever saw it again? Well, I'm not sure. I think I might, yes. It was one of those delivery trucks, you know. I think you'd call it a panel truck. It was a light tan color all over, and there was black lettering on the side. Mm-hmm. Could you make out any of the lettering at all? Well, I think there were three or four words painted on the side, and I know one of them was bakery. I'm sure of that. Did you recognize what make a truck it was, ma'am? The year, the model? It was a late model. I'm pretty sure of that. Either a Chevrolet or a Ford, I'd say. One of those regular delivery trucks like some bakeries use. You sure about that word you saw lettered on the side? It said bakery. Yes, I'm positive of that. Now, anything else out of the ordinary that you might have noticed about the truck, ma'am? Anything outstanding that might have caught your eye? No, I'm sorry, officer. That's about all I can tell you. How is the old lady? Do you know him, the little boy? Could they tell you anything? Yes, ma'am. The woman's dead. She was killed instantly. They've taken the youngster over to Georgia Street Receiving Hospital. Afraid he's in pretty bad shape, too. Terrible shame. Poor old lady. She lives right here in the neighborhood, you know. I've seen her shopping in the market next door here Saturday afternoon. It's just tragic. Yes, ma'am, it is. Boy's her grandson, you know. Somebody said he was down visiting her for the Christmas vacation. Seemed like a nice kid, well-behaved. She seemed so proud of him. Should be a sad Christmas for the family. Yeah. And just one more question, ma'am. When the boy and his grandmother were crossing the street, would you say the visibility was good? I mean, is there any reason why it would have been hard for a driver to see them? No reason in the world, officer. It's a clear night. You can see how well the intersections lighted up, all the Christmas lights strung up along here. Mm-hmm. The lights from the theater marquee was just as well lighted then as it is now. Yeah, let's see. The intersection was perfectly clear. No other cars around. The boy had a white sweater on. The old lady was wearing a light-colored coat. It's certainly easy to see the traffic light, too. It said stop. I can't understand why that driver didn't see him. No, ma'am, neither can we. How could anybody do such a thing? It just isn't an excuse for it. No excuse in the world. It's downright murder. Well, maybe that explains it. What? That's why I kept going. 
11.35 p.m. Ben and I finished interviewing the cashier in the theater box office, and then we called the office and had them get out a supplementary broadcast and an APB on the description of the hit-and-run vehicle. We went back across the street to the scene of the accident where the officers in the T-car, along with the crew from the crime lab, were finishing up their preliminary investigation. We interviewed two more witnesses to the hit-run accident, but they were unable to tell us anything that we didn't already know. When we got back to the office, we put in a call to Georgia Street Receiving Hospital where they told us the nine-year-old boy struck down by the hit-run driver was still in a critical condition. The husband of the 64-year-old woman, who'd been killed instantly, was brought downtown to the morgue where he identified the body. The next morning, we got out a special bulletin to all garages, auto repair, and paint shops throughout the city to be on the lookout for a late-model tan panel truck, black lettering on the sides with damage to the front end. 8.30 a.m., I checked with communications, and then I went back to the office. Hi. Just checked with Georgia Street, Joe. Ask him about the boy. The old lady's grandson? How's he doing? About the same. Critical condition. That's about all he'll say. That's a lousy shame. Communications get any kickback on the old point yet? No, nothing at all. Did you get in touch with the crime lab? Yeah, they're not going to be able to help much. What'd they find out there? Anything at all? Just what we saw. A few small pieces of glass, probably from one of the headlights on a truck. They don't think they're going to be able to do much with them. There's not enough for it to That's the only physical evidence they got, huh? That's all. Might be able to tie it down a little tighter if we could find that panel. Yeah. You start checking on that bakery truck angle yet? McGowan and I called every bakery in town. Got it pretty well narrowed down. There's only two companies that use tan late model panels for delivery trucks. Well. Only one of them uses black lettering on the sides of the truck. Other company says they use red lettering. Which one has the black? I uh, got it right here, uh... Outfit called Nielsen's Wholesale Bakery. They got a fleet of 173 trucks, all the same. Tan color, black lettering on both sides, late model Ford delivery truck. Mm-hmm. They tell you whether or not any of their drivers could have been making deliveries that time of night, 10, 30, 11 o'clock? Yeah, there were about a dozen of them out on deliveries. Uh, more of them to account for than that, though. What do you mean? All their drivers are allowed to take the trucks home with them when they're off duty if they want to. Yeah. I'm afraid it's going to mean checking out every one of them, Joe. Well, we might as well get moving on it. They're going to give us some kind of a list to work with, are they? Yeah, I've got it all set up with them. I'm getting it. Uh-huh. Accident investigation, Romero. Oh, yes, sir. That's all. Oh, I see. You're right, thank you. Rotten deal. Yeah, what's the matter? That young kid, the grandson? Yeah. He just died. Many times and on many different occasions, the police officer has it proved to him that there can be very little difference between a crime of neglect and a crime that's been willfully premeditated. If you look at it closely enough, you can judge it for yourself. How much difference, for example, as far as moral guilt is concerned, is there between the following? Number one, a man who plans a killing, takes up a gun, finds his victim, and shoots him to death. Or number two... The man who thinks he has to look out for no one's welfare but his own, gets behind the wheel of a car, disregards the ordinary rules of safety, and proceeds to commit homicide with a motor vehicle. Oftentimes, the crime masquerades under the guise of an accident. Morally, no matter how you spell it, it adds up to murder just as surely as if the person had taken a gun and shot the victim down. The way it looked to us, the hit-and-run killing of the elderly woman and her grandson was a prime example. Wednesday, December 22nd. Ben and I began checking out the delivery trucks owned by Nielsen's Wholesale Bakery. Late that afternoon, we located one of the trucks with recent damage to the front end. We checked and found the driver's name was Arthur V. Singer. We drove out to his home to interview him. No, I wasn't working last night, officer. I was off. What's it all about? Did you spend the night at home, Mr. Singer, or were you out? I was home part of the time. After dinner, I went downtown to a little bowling. Our neighborhood team bowls every Tuesday night. Where is that, sir? Place downtown. It's on West 7th. Got a pretty good team. Mm Mm-hmm. Did you drive down, Mr. Singer, or did you take the bus? No, I drove down. Had the company truck with me. Let us use them when we're off duty. We pay for the gas. Did you drive down by yourself, or was there someone else with you? No, I was alone. The other boys had their cars. When did you leave the bowling alley, you remember? Mm, about 10, 10, 15, I'd say. How'd you drive home, Mr. Singer? I mean, what route did you take? Oh, I drove straight out West 7th, got to Coronado, came over Coronado to the house here. Why do you want to know? What time did you get home? About quarter to 11. Yeah, this wouldn't be about that little scrape I had last night, would it? What was that? Down at 7th and Grandview, right by Westlake Park there. Old guy in the car ahead, he stopped fast right in front of me. Didn't even signal. All right. Yeah, I almost plowed right into him. Lucky I was watching. I slammed on the brakes, turned in toward the curb. Should have seen it. I clipped the headlight and the right fender against a telephone pole. Had to take the truck in this morning, get it fixed up. Are there any witnesses to this accident that you had, Singer? Yeah, a half dozen people saw it. Did you get any names and addresses? Well, 
No, I didn't. I was so teed off about the whole thing, I guess I didn't think about it. Is there anyone at all we can check with? Anybody to corroborate your story? Just the old guy in that car. Sure, a lousy driver. I really chewed him out. Did you get his name and address? No, but I took down his license number. I wasn't going to pay for that damage. He admitted it was his fault. I see. Do you mind giving us that license number? No, if I can find it. Wrote it down on the back of an old envelope. Thought I'd put it in my jacket, but when I looked this morning, it wasn't there. It's around someplace, so I'll check around again before I leave for work. It's bound to turn up. I'd like to have you look for it now, Mr. Singer. If you would, it's pretty important. Well, I think I get it, officer. What's this all about, anyway? Preliminary investigation. Want to see if you can find that number for us? Well, why? What's it have to do with an investigation? I didn't do anything. That old man was his fault. Well, a bakery truck was involved in a serious accident last night, the same kind that you were driving. I'm afraid you're going to need some kind of an alibi, Mr. Singer. An alibi? I don't know what you mean. Why do I have to have an alibi? Well, just take my word for it. You're going to need one. Well, why do I need one? Two reasons. Yeah? A nine-year-old boy and his grandmother. We continued questioning the suspect, Arthur Singer, but he denied any knowledge of the hit-run accident the night before at the intersection of Drexel and Pico Boulevard. We stayed with him while he searched his home for the license number of the car, which he said caused him to have his accident the night before. After half an hour of looking, he came up with a number scribbled on a scrap of paper which he'd found back in one corner on the floor of his closet. We put in a call to our DMV, and they came back with the information that the license number was registered to a Mr. Thomas Foley on Lancashire Boulevard. We drove out to the address to check with Mr. Foley, but there was nobody home. We left our card along with a message to contact us as soon as possible. 4.15 p.m., Ben and I got back to the office. At 4.35, Mr. Foley returned our call. Yes, sir, that's right. Oh, you did, uh-huh. I see. Well, what time was that? Do you remember? Oh. Well, all right, Mr. Foley. Thank you very much. We may be contacting you later. Right, bye. What'd you get? Thought this was starting out too easy. Why? What'd he say? Apparently, this Arthur Singer is telling us the truth. Mr. Foley says he did have a little scrape with a bakery truck last night. Described Singer as the driver of the truck. Well, what about the location? Is Foley pretty sure about that? Grandview and West 7. Says it happened about 10.35 last night. That puts Singer about three miles from the scene of the hit run. It's impossible, Joe. Yeah. This Mr. Foley's right. Singer couldn't have done it. Wasn't anywhere near the scene. I sure thought he was there, didn't you? We can drive out and double check with Foley. Can't think of any reason why he'd lie about it, can you? I just saw it. Accident investigation Friday. Yeah, it's had. What? Yeah. Nobody, huh? Yeah, right away, thanks. Well, it's moving a little fast. Got a piece of luck here. Who was it? Ted Zimmerman. He and McClendon are down south end of town. Yeah? The hit and run truck. They think maybe they found it. 28 p.m. Ben and I left the office and drove to the south end of the city where we met with Sergeant Zimmerman and McClendon, a block from where the tan panel bakery truck had been located. As soon as the truck had been discovered, an immediate stakeout was placed on it. A code 5 was broadcast on the vehicle's location, warning all units to stay away so as not to discourage the suspect in case he decided it was safe to return and get the truck. Ben and I drove down the side street where the truck was parked and got a good look at the front end of it. The right headlight was damaged and so was the right fender. While Zimmerman and McClendon remained on stakeout, Ben and I contacted the Nielsen Bakery people again, gave them the number of the truck, and they traced down the driver's name for us. He was listed as Daniel Miller. He'd been employed by the bakery for the past three years, and he had a good record. They told us this was his day off. 5.30 p.m. We checked at his home address, but his wife told us he wasn't there. She said that besides driving a truck for the bakery, he also had a part-time job at night. He worked as a counterman at a small coffee shop out on Wilshire Boulevard. We drove out to the coffee shop and interviewed him on the job. No, I'm sorry. I don't know where the truck is. I wish I did. Well, what happened, Mr. Miller? Was it stolen? No, no, not exactly. A fellow that comes in here quite a bit, his name's Paul. Good customer. He borrowed the truck from me last night. Said he'd only be gone an hour. I haven't seen him since. Where does this man live, this friend of yours, Paul? Well, to tell you the truth, I don't know. Good customer. He comes in quite a bit at night when I'm working. Got to know him pretty well. He has to borrow the truck for an hour. Didn't think much about it. Let him have it. Is there anything wrong? What's this Paul's last name, you know? No, I guess I don't. Never thought to ask him, as a matter of fact. Guess they never had any reason to. About what time was it last night that you loaned him the truck? A little after 8 o'clock, I think it was. He said he wanted to take his television set over to a guy he knew and get it fixed. He told me he'd be back by 10 o'clock at the latest. You don't know where this man lives? You have no idea at all how to get in touch with him? No, I guess I don't, Sergeant. Why? You're in the habit of lending the truck to strangers? No, well, not usually. Well, what's your beef, anyway? What's this all about? What are your hours here at the coffee shop, Miller? When do you check in for work and when do you leave? I check in at 7 o'clock. I go a straight five hours to midnight. That's when we close out midnight. Well, you worked that shift last night, did you? 7 p.m. straight through to midnight? That's right. Monday through Saturday. Six days a week. That's the schedule. 
It's just a part-time job for me, extra dough, you know. My regular job is driving the truck for the bakery. Was anyone around last night when your friend Paul came in to borrow the truck? Maybe another customer, a waitress, somebody we could double-check with? No, there were a couple other customers in the place. Don't know who they were, though. Why do you have to double-check anyway? I haven't done anything. I loaned Paul a truck, that's all. Well, have you any way at all of proving you were here from 7 to 12 last night? Must have been some customers you waited on that you remember. Sure, there are at least half dozen of them. They'll tell you I was here. I'd like to have their names and addresses, if you don't mind, Miller. Yeah. Excuse me a minute, huh? Got a customer to wait sure, on. Sure, go right in. All right, Dan, I missed you last night. All right, Fred, what do you have? Coffee, a couple of those donuts back there, pot of sugar ones. Okay. Yeah, me and the missus dropped in for a sandwich after the show last night. We're looking for you. That so? Yeah, about 10.30. Where were you, Dan? p.m. Wednesday, December 22nd. We continued questioning the hit-run suspect, Daniel Miller, for a full hour, but he seemed to be unable to account for his time the previous night. His first story was that he'd been on duty behind the counter in the coffee shop without a break between the hours of 7 p.m. and midnight. Then, after the customer entered and disclosed that he was in the coffee shop at 10.30 the night before and that Miller was nowhere about, the suspect switched his story. He said he thought he left the coffee shop briefly for about 15 minutes between 10.30 and 10.45 p.m. to run down the street to a hotel to say goodbye to some friends of his who were leaving for New York. We checked at the hotel, but they didn't know Miller, and they hadn't seen him the night before. They were sure of it. We returned to the coffee shop and took up the questioning of the suspect all over again, but he made little or no sense at all. Apparently, he was piling up lie after lie in an effort to cover his tracks before and after the hit-and-run murder the night before. 7.48 p.m., Ben and I pulled Miller off the job at the coffee shop and took him downtown to the interrogation room. I'm telling you, it's the truth. I wasn't in that truck last night. I wasn't in an accident. I don't know what you're talking about. Well, then give us something to go on, Miller. You've handed three different stories so far. Not one of them strong enough to hold water. I'm telling you the truth. What are you trying to hang this on me for? I didn't have a wreck and I didn't kill anybody. Why are you picking on me? Because you don't make sense, mister. You're trying to sell us a story and you haven't got one ounce of proof to back it up. That bakery truck you're responsible for is the same truck that killed the old woman and the little boy. Now, you come up with a solid story that we can check on it, you're going to be resting your back in the main jail. No wonder they call you cops dumb. I wasn't in that truck last night. Can't you get that through your heads? I wasn't in the truck. I didn't have an accident. Then prove it to us, Mr. Miller. That's all we're waiting for. Uh, listen, call Bill Calder. He's a good customer. He was in last night, I think. He'll tell you. Go ahead and call him. He'll back up what I say. What's his number? Do you know? Yeah, I, I got it. Yeah, right, right here in my wallet. Now, Bill can tell you. Yeah, here it is. Thank you. Hello, William Calder there, please. Yes, ma'am, it's important. All right, will you have him call Michigan 5211? Yeah, 5211. That's extension 2512. Right, thank you very much. Well, he's busy. He'll call back in a minute. He'll tell you the truth. I was in the coffee shop all night. Just those couple of minutes, I ran down to the hotel to say goodbye to those friends of mine. That's the only time I left the place. Well, how come you couldn't tell us that to begin with, Miller? You say you've got nothing to hide? Well, why do you have to hand us three different stories? Which one are we supposed to believe? I got nervous, that's all, when you first come in and started to ask questions. I didn't know what it was all about. I didn't know there was any trouble. I just loaned the truck to this guy, Paul, as a favor. How do I know what he was going to do? Getting himself in a jam like that. All right, now try to look at it from where we stand, Miller. You loan out your truck to a man. You don't know his last name. You don't know where he lives. You say he must have been driving the truck when the lady and the boy were killed. Sure, he must have been driving it. I wasn't. I was back at the coffee shop. I was there until midnight. All right, then prove it to us. If you know the man well enough to loan him the truck, you ought to be able to find him. <laughs> now, they, uh, must be Bill Calder. He'll tell you. Go ahead. See what he says. Yeah. Interrogation room, Friday. Oh, yeah, Mr. Calder. Well, my name's Sergeant Friday, LAPD, Accident Investigation. Friday, yes, sir, that's right. Wonder if you'd tell me if you know a Daniel Miller? Mm-hmm. When's the last time you saw him? Do you remember? I see. The place where he works, the coffee shop? Were you in there last night by any chance? Did you see Miller in there? You're sure? Yes, sir. No, sir, that's all for now. Thank you very much. We're going to contact you later on. Thank you. Goodbye. 
Well, how about it? He told you, didn't he? That enough for you? He says he hasn't been in the coffee shop for three days. 9.45 p.m. Our interrogation of the hit-and-run suspect, Daniel Miller, went on. At his suggestion, we called half a dozen people who he figured might substantiate his alibi, but none of them were able to. Miller continued to deny any knowledge of the hit-run killing, but he still couldn't account for his whereabouts at the exact hour the nine-year-old boy and his grandmother were run down. The time element especially didn't work in his favor. Nothing worked in his favor. 11.30 p.m., Ben and I took Daniel Miller over to the main jail where he was booked in on suspicion of 480 V.C. The following afternoon, his lawyer obtained a writ and he was released from custody. The writ was returnable in five days. He came immediately to the office to plead with Ben and I to help him find Paul, the man who'd borrowed his truck and thus clear himself. We took him up on it. Either way, we figured we'd get to the bottom of it. If Miller dreamed up the character Paul to escape blame for the hit-and-run killing, we were bound to find out sooner or later. If Miller was telling the truth, we had little reason to believe he was, and a man named Paul had borrowed the truck the night of the hit-and-run killing, we were bound to find that out, too. In any event, we had to investigate. It's the job of the police officer to prove guilt or innocence, not guilt alone. Two days passed, and then another two. The Monday following the Christmas weekend, we were ready to call a halt. I don't know what else we can do. I think we've given enough time, don't you? The deeper we get into it, the more it looks like Miller's our man. I still can't make a murmur. Why do you have to be stubborn about it? We've checked every possible angle on this story. We still haven't an ounce of proof that this guy Paul he talks about even exists. We can't string along with Miller forever. Yeah, I suppose you're right. We've given him a square enough break on it. I still got that funny hunch. It's possible he might be telling the truth. We've gone four straight days on it, Joe. Haven't come across one lead to back up his story. It's too much for me. I can't buy it anymore. Go ahead. Sergeant? Oh, how are you, Miller? I'm okay. Glad to see you. I've been looking for you. We've been looking for your friend, Miller. Still haven't found a trace of him. That's why I came down to see you. A friend of mine called me this morning. He knows this guy, Paul, I told you about. He says he saw him last night, going into a hotel down on South Flower. How come we haven't heard from this friend of yours before? We've checked through twice on the list of everybody you know. This fellow's been out of town, just got back yesterday. When he heard about the jam I was in, he called me about seeing Paul. Mm -hmm. This hotel Paul was supposed to have been seen going into. Have you got the address of that? Yeah, it's over on South Flower, right near 12th. You want to go over there with me right now? This friend of mine wouldn't kid me. Paul must be there. You are sure about that? He must be there. I'll bet a month's pay on it. You might be low, mister. What? Stands to cost you a lot more than that. We went up to the third floor, room 318, but the man registered as Paul Barton wasn't in. He'd left no word at the desk as to when he'd return. We sent Miller home and told him to wait for our call. Ben and I went on stakeout at the hotel. At 7.25 that night, Paul Barton returned to his room and we began questioning him. He showed no signs of being upset. His answers were quick, straightforward, and they seemed to make sense. The interview went on. A half hour, an hour, and Barton began to grow a little nervous. He contradicted himself. Big holes began to show up in his story as to how and where he'd spent his time the night of the hit-run killing. 8.45 p.m., Ben and I took Barton back to the office. We found Zimmerman in the squad room and had him phone Miller at his home and ask him to come downtown as soon as possible. Meantime, we checked Paul Barton through R&I, and then we took him to the interrogation room where the questioning went on. You're a little mixed up about that, aren't you, Mr. Barton? I thought you said you went to that bar downtown about 10 p.m., and then you went to visit at your sister's house. Now you tell us you went to your sister's house first, and then you went to the bar downtown. Now, which is it? Well, that's getting a little high-handed, isn't it? Why do I have to account for my time to you? If it wasn't important, we wouldn't be asking you. I think you know that. Well, I don't know anything of the kind. You're trying to take advantage of me. That's the only impression I can get. I think I've answered enough of your questions. I'm going back to the hotel. Just a minute, Barton. There's one more thing. Huh? Last time you were arrested for a traffic violation, you want to tell us what the charge was? What? I think you heard me. Well, that was a year ago. I was driving a little too fast going out Beverly Boulevard. And what's that got to do with it? Our record bureau says the charge was for drunk driving. Your license was revoked, isn't that right? Well, so what? I haven't been driving. I haven't been near a car. What about last Tuesday night? Huh? Last Tuesday night, did you do any driving then? No, no, of course not. You're sure about that? You're not trapping me. I answered all your questions. I'm getting no, out of here. No, you're going to stay right where you are, mister. Stay put. Ben, you want to check next door, see if Miller's come in, will you? Yeah, okay. You can't make me stay here. It's illegal. You got nothing to hold me on. All right, then there's nothing to worry about. This won't take very long. We got a man by the name of Miller coming in. He says he thinks he knows you. Miller? I don't know any Miller. Nice going, Paul. Where you been? I said, where you been? What'd you do with the truck? I'm getting up here. Yeah. Grab him, Ben. Grab him. Yeah, I got him. Okay. All, okay. Right. All right. Now, now let me go. Right. Let me go. Settle down. Settle down. Come on, mister. Settle down. 
I didn't do it. I didn't do a thing. I... Well, look, you can't prove it. You, you can't prove it, I did. They're going to prove it, Paul. I'm going to help them prove it. You should have been a real good friend. But give me a break, Danny. I, I didn't mean it. Honest, I didn't mean it. I loan you the truck. You get boozed up. You run down the little kid and the grandmother. Then you take off and leave me holding the sack, like I did it. Well, I didn't mean it, Danny. It was an accident. I wasn't boozed up. Yeah, you're a real good friend. I hope you get it in the neck. I hope you get it with both barrels. Look, Sergeant, it's not true. I wasn't boozed up. I only had two drinks. Now, believe me, that's all I had. Yeah. I couldn't have been drunk. It doesn't affect me that way. Two drinks never hurt me. A couple of drinks never hurt anybody. They killed a little boy and his grandmother. The story you have just heard was true. The names were changed to protect the innocent. On February 28th, trial was held in Superior Court, Department 87, City and County of Los Angeles, State of California. Paul Barton was filed on for violation of the State Vehicle Code, Section 480, a hit-and-run felony, and also for manslaughter, two counts. He was convicted only for Section 480 and received sentence as prescribed by law. A hit-and-run felony is punishable by imprisonment in the state penitentiary for not less than one, nor more than five years. Just heard Dragnet, a series of authentic cases from official files. Technical advice comes from the office of Chief of Police, W.H. Parker. The story you are about to hear is true. The names have been changed to protect the innocent. Fatima Cigarettes, best of all king size cigarettes, brings you Dragnet. <laughs> You're a detective sergeant. You're assigned to burglary detail. One of your informants contacts you by telephone. He says he wants to see you immediately. He claims knowledge of more than two dozen burglaries committed in your city. He offers the information despite threats against his own life. Your job, investigate. The latest Fatima sales report shows thousands and thousands of king-size cigarette smokers are switching to Fatima. For the month of October, coast-to-coast actual figures show Fatima sales are up 110%, or more than double. Fatima, best of all king-size cigarettes. Definitely the best quality in its class, but the same price as the cigarette you are now smoking. Remember... Thousands of Americans are switching to extra mild Fatima. Next time, insist on the best, King Size Fatima, in the distinctive golden yellow package. Dragnet, the documented drama of an actual crime. For the next 30 minutes, in cooperation with the Los Angeles Police Department, You will travel step by step on the side of the law through an actual case transcribed from official police files. From beginning to end, from crime to punishment, Dragnet is the story of your police force in action. It was Monday, April 16th. It was foggy in Los Angeles. We were working the day watch out of burglary detail. My partner's Ben Romero. The boss is Captain Wisdom. My name's Friday. We were on the way out from the office, and it was 1.38 p.m. when we got to the corner of North Main and Sotelo Street. Johnny Copen's Cafe. Pretty well filled up. You want to sit at the counter? Oh, there's a booth over there in the corner. People just leaving. Oh, yeah. Didn't see it. This is all right, isn't it? Yeah, fine. Oh, it smells good. I wonder what the special is today. Well, it's up there on the blackboard. Oh, yeah. Enchilada with cheese, coleslaw, salad. It does smell pretty good, doesn't it? Wish I hadn't had lunch. I should have waited. I keep forgetting Monday's enchilada day down here. Sure like the way Johnny fixes it. Hello, Friday. Ben, how are you? Bye, Bye Roberta. Here, yeah, get these dirty dishes out of the way. Okay, fine. Is it going to be the special? No, we forgot today was Monday. We had lunch already. Mm, it's too bad. What'll it be? Just coffee? Yeah, it's fine. Friday? Yeah, same from you, Roberta. Both of them black, I guess. Okay, two blacks. So you haven't seen Smalley around this afternoon, have you, Roberta? Red Smalley? Red? No, I haven't seen him for a couple of days. Okay. Thought he said to meet him here at 1.30. Well, he'll be along. He's never been on time as long as I've known him. Yeah, I wonder what's eating him. He sounded a little excited on the phone. 
to give you any idea what it was all about? No, I just said it was important. I had to see it. Hey, I'm just thinking. Maybe I could handle one of those enchiladas after all. Yeah, there's Red. All right, right fellas. Hope I ain't late. All, all right. right. Been a long time, yeah, huh? Yeah, sit down, Red. Good to see you. Yeah, thanks. What's new with you, anyway? Not too much. How's it with you? Here you are. Two coffees black, are you, Red? Hungry. What about a hamburger steak, huh? Some coffee, too. Hamburger steak and coffee, right. You're looking pretty fair shape, Red. You working steady now? Well, you know how it goes. On again, off again. Put in a full month playing bar boy at Ziggy's joint place down in South Main, you know? Mm-hmm. What happened there? Business fell off, and Ziggy said he had to let me go. Been kind of thin ever since. I'm hustling programs out of the racetrack right now. It's not too bad. Can't afford to bet, but I get to see the races free. You can't have everything, I guess. I understand you're a little worried about something, Red. Anything serious? Well, yeah, it might be. My guy's telling Romero on the phone. Wouldn't do me no good if it got out. I mean, me talking to you about it, you know. He'd probably tie a can to my tail if he knew I told you. Who's that? Guy by the name of Jeff Allen. Know him? No, it doesn't sound familiar to me. Ben? Me neither. Who is he, Red? Second story worker. Lots of savvy, too. He's fell a couple of times on burglary raps. Knows his business, so got a lot of moxie. How long has he been in town, you know? Well, about six months, I think. Come from the east, finished the stretch back in Michigan. He's a real pro. Uh-huh. What's he doing out here, Red? Well, matter of fact, that's why I want to talk to you about. Figured maybe you ought to know. Yeah? He's doing real good, the way I get it. I heard him and a couple other guys talking about it one night down at Ziggy's. They were having a couple of beers. I guess they didn't think I could hear him. What'd they have to say? This guy, Allen, was running off about how good he was doing, how many places he knocked over in the last couple of months, how much stuff he took. And what's he look like, Red? Oh, pretty average, about my height, dark hair, a little scar right here uh, yeah, on his chin. Mm-hmm. About 160, 70, maybe, 36 years old. Usually wears leather jacket and black one. All right, Red, here you go. Burger steak, coffee. Yeah, yeah fine. You got a good appetite these days, working out in the air, you know. It does good. Yeah. Yeah. I'll show you one pass around my way, Patrick, Sergeant. Oh, yeah. Here you go. Uh-huh. Oh, yeah. Good. Yeah. 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 These burglary jobs, Alan's supposed to be pulling red. Where's he working them? Do you know that? Well, no, I guess they don't. All over town, I suppose. Sure, good hamburger. When you ever heard him talking to his friends, did he mention any jobs in particular that he pulled? No, he's working hard. I know that for a fact. He pulls a new one every week or so, the way I get out. And what about his M.O., Red? Uh, regular second story routine. He uses a Jimmy or a small pinch bar. He usually goes through a window. Does he work alone? Uh-huh, strictly. Say, his French bread's nice and fresh. Yeah. Where's Alan staying in town? Do you know, Red? No, I don't. I know where I can find him, though. With 1322 Club out on North Paris. He hangs out there quite a bit almost every night. I think the guy who owns the joints for finding his. Jeff Allen. Is that supposed to be his right name, Red? As far as I know, uh huh. I only met him a couple of times. He hung around Ziggy's place when he first came to town. Of course, I didn't know what he was up to then. You know him well enough to talk to him? Well, just a lot, yeah. I'm not buddies with him or anything. That's why I don't want to get out, you know. If he gets the word I'm on your team, I'm a dead duck. I don't think he wastes a minute to kill me. You don't have to worry, Red. We'll keep it quiet. Well, did you hear anything else? Or is that just about the size of him? No. That's just about it, fellas. I'll keep near the ground. If I get any more rumbles, I'll pass it on. Well, I guess you know I really hate to talk about it. What's that, Red? Well, I know mean, how bad things have been running lately, you know, since I got laid off of Ziggy. Uh-huh. I hustle like mad with the programs down the track. Doesn't bring in a whole lot, though. And a lousy landlady had to raise my rent last week. Mm-hmm. Well, how much can you use, Red? Well, you know, as far as anything at all, just a little loan, maybe something to help me over the home. Well, the only thing I have is a 20, Joe. You got any change? Uh, thanks, Romero. 20 will be fine. That's plenty. I sure appreciate that. Oh, yeah. Well, real good hamburger steak, Johnny puts up. Uh, I gotta get going, fellas. Gotta be down the track. All right, Red. Thanks a lot. If there's anything else, call us, huh? You got our number. Sure thing. I'll stay right on. Mm-hmm. If you want me for anything, holler, huh? I'm still at the same place. Right. Thanks a lot, huh? I'll see you later. Yeah. Take it easy, Red. Yeah. Bye, Red. Hmm. 
She's getting a little expensive, huh? He's probably been having a rough time, but he looked hungry to me. Sure did. Grab that $20 bill like his life depended on him. I wanted to buy some new wool socks for that. Well, I'll split it with you. It'll be worth more than 20 bucks if the tip pays off. Now, don't get me wrong. I didn't mind giving him the 20 bucks. It's worth it, but look at this here. Oh, you have to check for the food, huh? Yeah, I think the least he could have done was pay for his own lunch. the character of the informant in fact or fiction isn't generally regarded with too much sympathy. To most people, the informant's nothing more than a stool pigeon, a squealer, somebody who, by the very act of informing, commits a sin against a supposedly popular unwritten law. Well, it's obvious that this isn't always so, because in the interests of law enforcement and justice, which means the betterment of the community, the informant very often plays a major role. Year after year, informants are responsible for the apprehension and conviction of many hundreds of criminals, people who rob and cheat and commit murder, crimes that are obviously far deadlier than informing. As for the mechanics of law enforcement at the level of the working detective, the informant is considered virtually indispensable. It's been said before by peace officers, and it'll probably be said again quite a few times. If your job is catching criminals and enforcing the law... This is the first rule you have to learn. The working detective is no better than his informants. 2.12 p.m. Ben and I had no idea if the information we'd gotten from Red Smalley was authentic or not, but it had to be checked out. We went back to the office and had Frank Cunningham and R and I check on Jeff Allen. We also had the stats office make a run for us on suspects with similar M.O.s. Then we started to page through reports of burglaries which had occurred throughout the city during the past three months. Hmm, no. Mm-mm. How you doing over there? Anything at all? Not too much. Wait a minute, maybe. This might be one of them. Here, let me see. Home in Hollenbeck Park neighborhood. Burglar's M.O. matches out in a time element, too. Happened six weeks ago. Window on the second floor of the house was pried open. They took furs and money, $23. Uh-huh. That's the only one you found? Another one here I took out a minute ago. Him was pretty much the same on this one, too. Only thing different is the night of the week it happened on. This one's a Thursday. That one there's a Sunday. Yeah, it checks out pretty close otherwise. The only one thing I can't figure. What's that? Well, Alan's supposed to have been in the city for at least six months. According to Red, he's working a job maybe once a week, once every ten days or so. Now, you've got two reports there that matches them all here. I picked out two more from that other pile. Seems to me if he's been working in town for a couple of months, there ought to be more than four reports on him, shouldn't it? I got it. Uh, Burglar and Merrill. Oh, yeah, fine. Mm-hmm, Jeff Allen. Is that so? Oh, you have, huh? Okay, right, Frank, thank you. Yeah? Why not? I got to make on Allen. He's had one arrest here four years ago on a vag charge. He's a loser out of Michigan. Fell for burglary. Never been picked up for burglary here, though. He isn't registered. That's all, huh? That's it. Doesn't seem to gel right to me, does it to you? A lot of loose ends to figure out. I wonder if Red was handing us a line on this thing. Why would he? Well, maybe he needed that $20 touch. Maybe this Jeff Allen's an old pal of his. Red had a falling out with him. He wants to get even with him, I suppose. Possible, I guess. I don't know. Hi, Charles. Ben? Oh, hello, Saber, what do you say? What's with you? You still in that stakeout south end of town? Yeah, third week. Sure getting dull. You two are busy. What's all this? Oh, well, we got a tip on some prowl artist trying to get a line on him. Take a look at this 3.1, will you, Jim? You run into any jobs recently to stack up like this in here? I see. We're shooting in the dark on it so far. I don't know if we got anything or not. I'd say he got it. Burglary report in 77th Division this morning. Happened to check it when I was out there. Same M.O. as this? Same everything. 4.55 p.m. Ben and I went down the hall to the record bureau and picked up a couple of mug shots of the suspect, Jefferson Allen. Then we drove out to the 1322 Club on North Ferris Avenue in the Silver Lake District, the neighborhood bar where Allen spent most of his time, according to our informant, Red Smalley. We staked out in a car down the street where we could keep an eye on the front door to the bar and still not look suspicious. Between 5 and 7.30 p.m., we watched at least two dozen customers entering or leaving the bar, but none of them came close to Alan's description. 8 p.m., nothing. By the time we were relieved on stakeout at 11 p.m., Alan still had failed to show. Late the following afternoon, we were back at the same spot, watching for a sign of the suspect. 6.48 p.m. How you fixed your smokes? Oh, I think I got a couple left. Yeah, here you go. Oh, thanks. This is the real life thing, huh? I got a light here. Yeah. You're not going to eat. Fix this thing. One, one, eight. Fix this thing. 
Hey, have a look, Joe. Gray hat, dark suit. Just came out of the bar. Yeah. Coming this way. Yeah, I'll buy it. That's him. Getting in that blue sedan. All right, don't press him. Let's give him a good lead. All right. Just get him in. Mm-hmm. What do you think, Joe? Let's wait a minute. Uh-huh. Yeah, okay, we're clear. All right. You got him spotted? Yeah, no trouble. That's a funny one, huh? Wonder why we didn't see him go in the bar. I don't know. Might be a delivery entrance in the back of the place we could have missed. Can you make out that license number? Can you pull out just a little? Yeah. That's good. Yeah, let's see. Seven Tom Seven Nine Seven Two. I better check it. Eighty K to Control One. Eight O K to Control One. Control One to Eighty K. Go ahead. Control One, request rolling make and DMV on Seven Tom Seven Nine Seven Two. That's Seven Tom Seven Nine Seven Two. Control One to Eighty K. Roger. Stand by. KMA Three Six Seven. Doesn't seem to be in any great hurry. Barely poking along. Where is he now? I can't see. Just turn right on to Bronson. I want to give him plenty of lead. Huh? Yeah. That's him up ahead there. He's picking up speed. Now, don't lose him. All right. Control 1 to 80K. Control 1 to 80K. Come in, please. Here we go. 80K to Control 1. Go ahead. 7, Tom, 7, 9, 7, 2. The car is registered to D. Denver, J. John, Carpenter. 13, 22, North Ferris Avenue, Los Angeles. 80K to Control 1, Roger, KMA 367. Carpenter, same guy owns a bar, isn't it? His Allen must know him pretty well. Well enough to use his car. Wonder what the pitch is there. You checked on Carpenter, didn't you? Yeah, clean bill of health, no record. Yeah, up ahead there, now he's slowing down. Yeah, turning up on that driveway. Pull up under that tree there, huh? Right. That's fine. See him? Uh-huh. He's getting out, going into that bungalow over there. Letting himself in the front door. No sign of anybody else there, huh? No. House was dark when we drove up, wasn't it? He couldn't be living there alone. He might be. Doesn't make much sense to me. Why would a single guy get himself a house that big? Well, let's wait it out. Maybe he'll come up with the answer. 9.15 p.m. We continued our stake out on the bungalow on South Bronson Avenue. A little more than an hour passed when we saw the lights go out in the house. The suspect, Jeff Allen, came out the front door, locked up, got in his car and drove off. Ben and I followed him. He drove directly to the bar on North Ferris Avenue, the 1322 Club. He parked his car and went inside. Ben and I drove back to the cottage on South Bronson and let ourselves in through the back door. A preliminary check of the house failed to give us any real proof that Alan was the suspect we wanted. The only possible lead we came up with was an expensive hunting rifle, which we found stored away in one of the closets. We copied down the serial number on the gun drove to a neighborhood cigar store, called the office, and asked him to check out the number for us. Yeah, all right, Murph. We'll wait for the call. Yeah, thanks. How'd you do? I'm going to check it through now. That call us. Good. I'm a little hungry, aren't you? Do you like candy bar? No, I'm getting a little tired of them. I wouldn't mind a square meal, though. My back's killing me. Never been so sore in my life. Why, what's the matter? Did you fall? No, nothing like that. It's my snoring again. You're snoring? What's that got to do with it? Almost broke my back. It was a wife's idea. She claims when I'm sleeping, I roll over on my back and snore, says it keeps her awake all night. Well, there's not much you can do about it, is it? Yeah, the wife thought of something. It's supposed to be an old home remedy. She sewed a couple of golf balls right into the back of my pajamas. You get the idea behind it? If you roll over on your back, the golf balls dig into you and you have to roll over on your side again. Mm-hmm. Well, so what happened to you? Well, I'm a sound sleeper. Rolled over on my back and stayed there. Slept on those golf balls all night. Woke up in the morning and liked to have died. Felt like I'd snapped a couple of vertebrae. Mm, must be an easier way to keep you from sleeping on your back. Oh, it wouldn't do any good anyhow, Joe. It just won't work. What do you mean? I snore just as loud sleeping on my side. I get it. Hello? Yeah, Mert. This is Joe Friday. Mm-hmm. W615-344. Yeah, that checks. That was a serial number. When was that? Uh-huh. Yeah. Yeah, okay, Murph. Thanks. Bye. I think maybe we got a break. Yeah? They got a make on the gun we found. Is it registered to Allen? No, it was taken in a burglary two months ago. You are listening to Dragnet. Authentic stories of your police force in action. Millions heard it. 
yet only 46 have written. Starting on Dragnet over a month and a half ago, on September 20th to be exact, Fatima made a special money-back offer to more than 10 million listeners. The results? Amazing. Millions heard it, yet only 46 have written. If you smoke king-size cigarettes, listen to Fatima's famous offer. Buy a pack of Fatima's. Enjoy their extra mildness and superbly blended tobaccos. If you're not convinced Fatima is better than the king-size cigarette you're now smoking, just return the pack and the unsmoked Fatimas before December 1st, and we'll give you your money back, plus postage. Fatima, Box 37, New York 1. Fatima's latest sales report shows Fatima sales up in every state in America. The month of October, coast to coast, actual figures show Fatima sales up 110%, or more than double. Yes, thousands and thousands of Americans are switching to king-size Fatima. So why wait? Switch to Fatima today. Extra mild. Best of all, king-size cigarettes. Tuesday night, April 17th, 10.38 p.m., we got additional information from the office on the hunting rifle that we'd found in the bungalow to which we'd trailed the suspect, Jefferson Allen, a few hours earlier. The gun was registered to a Mr. Robert LaSalle, 3008 Bush Street. The rifle, along with $300 in jewelry and $48 in cash, had been taken from LaSalle's home two months before during his family's absence. The burglar's method of operation matched Allen's alleged M.O. exactly. 10.45 p.m., after arranging for a stakeout to be placed on the bungalow on Bronson Avenue, Ben and I drove to the 1322 Club on North Ferris, where we located the suspect, Jeff Allen. Yes, sir, that's correct, Sergeant. I'm from back in Michigan originally. Been out here about six months now. I think I'm going to like it. Sure can't beat this weather, huh? You've been working here at the board ever since you got in town, is that right? No, not quite. I've been here for about four months. Kind of a handyman job. I help the bartender when I can, keep the storeroom in order, see everything ship shaped, you know. Uh huh. You ever been in Los Angeles before, Alan? Yeah, just once before, a couple of years ago. Wasn't so good then. Jobs were hard to get. I ran into a little bit of trouble. Finally went back east again. I see. What was this trouble you had? Well, as I say, jobs were pretty hard to come by then. I kept checking around, but I couldn't find anything. Wasn't so good. I finally got picked up on a bag charge. Mm hmm. Spent a couple of weeks at the county. When I got out, I figured the best thing was to head back east again. A lot better this time, though. I'm doing okay. See, I couldn't get you anything. Huh? No, no thank you. thanks. It's the same. There's something maybe you'd like to talk to me about? Anything I can help you with? It's a routine checkup we're on. Got a few more questions for you, if you don't mind. Sure. So, let's take one of these booths back here, huh? Might as well be comfortable. Yeah, okay. Go ahead. You sure I couldn't get you anything? A bottle of beer, Coke, maybe? No, no, thanks. You have your family out here with you, Alan, your wife? No, I'm not married, Sergeant. I haven't taken the plunge yet. Figure there's plenty of time for that. Hard enough to keep myself going these days, let alone a family. Yeah, I know what you mean. You ever been arrested before, Alan? I mean, other than that bag charge you mentioned, you ever served any big time? Yeah, matter of fact, I have, back in Michigan. Pretty dumb trick. I got in trouble as a kid. Burglary. Served all my time, though. I don't owe him a day. I'm washed up with that stuff a long time ago. It just doesn't pay, that's all. Uh-huh. Then that last time there was any trouble with that bag charge, is that it? Yes, sir, that's it. As I say, I'm all washed up with that stuff. It doesn't pay off at all. I got wise to that. Mm-hmm. Glad to hear it, Alan. You figure you're going to stay on here, then. Make this your permanent home. Yeah, I think I might. I sure like the weather. Job suits me, too. Boss even lets me use his car once in a while. Pretty nice, huh? Yeah, huh? Where are you living now? You got an apartment in the neighborhood here? Yeah, I got an apartment. Nice little place. Not exactly in the neighborhood, though. It's out in West Hollywood, right on a bus line. No trouble getting into work. Just a small apartment. Whereabouts in West Hollywood? You mind giving us the address? No, it's on Norwich Avenue. Why do you ask? It's part of this routine check we have to make. You mind very much if we drive out there with you? I don't look the place over. No, I don't mind. I mean, if you figure I need checking out, I'd just as soon clear it up now. I got nothing to hide. You want me to get my coat? No, that's all right. Say, uh... I should be back here in an hour or so. What do you think? I mean, it's just a routine check. It won't take long, will it? No, not too long. I suppose you can figure that better than we can. How do you mean? You said you had nothing to hide. 
11.20 p.m., we drove the suspect, Jeff Allen, to his apartment on Norwich Avenue. It was more than two and a half miles from the bungalow on South Bronson where we'd followed Allen earlier that night and where we'd located the stolen hunting rifle. While Ben and I made a thorough check of the apartment, Allen sat relaxed in an easy chair. Ben and I covered everything in the apartment, but there was no evidence of any loot taken in the burglaries. That's about it, Joe. Checked everything. Okay. That's about it, huh, Sergeant? You fellas want a beer before we go back to the club? Uh, just one or two more questions, Alan, and I think we can wash this thing up. Sure, Sergeant. Do you rent some other place in town? Another house or an apartment, maybe? Another place? No. Why would I do that? This is my apartment. This is where I live. Why do you ask that? About 6 o'clock tonight, you were seen going into a bungalow over on South Bronx in the same neighborhood as the club where you work. We got a pretty good idea that there's quite a bit of loot from burglary stored in that house. I don't follow you, Sergeant. I don't know what you mean. I don't live on South Bronson. I live here. You ought to be able to tell that. You were seen going into the bungalow, Alan, about five minutes past six tonight. We found a stolen hunting rifle in the house. It was taken in a burglary. You think you want to tell us about it? No, I can't tell you anything about it. I don't have any bungalow on South Bronson. I'm not even sure I can tell you where the street is. Well, you better get your hat, mister. We'll show you. <laughs> 11.48 p.m. We got in the car and started driving down Beverly Boulevard back toward the bungalow on South Bronson Avenue. When we got to the bungalow, the suspect still refused to admit that he had a key to the door or that he was in any way concerned with the place. We had him empty his pockets, and among his possessions, we found a ring of keys. We tried them on the front door of the bungalow. The fourth one we tried opened it. We went inside. Alan still would admit nothing. Ben contacted the landlady next door, and she said she'd be right over. I continued questioning him while Ben checked through the house again. Hey, Joe. Oh. Uh, Joe, you want to come back here? I think we've got some. Yeah, all right, Ben. You want to go ahead back there, Alan? Sure, okay. I still can't tell you what the score is, though. I don't belong in this place. It ain't mine. Well, that key you had seemed to fit the front door all right. How do you figure that? It doesn't mean anything. I had that key for years. I think it's a skeleton key. Opens almost any kind of lock. Down here, Joe. Small basement here. Leads right down off the kitchen. Yeah, all right. Go ahead, Alan. Hmm. Have a look, Joe. Line of cupboards all the way around here. Check them for yourself. Yeah, all right. It's a pretty good haul. Furs, machinist tools, jewelry, quite a bit of it here. A couple of radios, two more hunting rifles. Come on, how about it, Alan? You want to save time for all of us now? You got it wrong, Sergeant. This isn't my place, I told you. When I got out of that trouble back east, I made up my mind I was all washed up with this kind of stuff. This house isn't mine. I haven't got anything to do with it. You're kidding yourself, Alan. You know that. No, oh, you got it all wrong. You got it all mixed up. Well, we'll let the landlady tell us. Hmm? The woman who owns this house, she's on her way over from next door. She ought to be able to tell us who she rented the place to. Wouldn't you say so? Wouldn't you? She might be wrong. It's possible. No, look, we got you dead to rights, mister. Why not face it? Can't. I won't do it. I made up my mind the last time. It wouldn't happen again. I was all washed up with it. I won't go through it again. They'll send me back. I won't be able to take it. Maybe you should have figured that before you started in. I didn't mean to. I was all washed up with that stuff. I told you that the first time I saw you, didn't I? Yeah. I'm sure of it, too. I wouldn't try it again. Didn't pay. It's just what I told you. I'm all through with it. I'm washed up with it. I never lied to you, did I? What's the difference? Huh? You lied to yourself. The story you have just heard was true. The names were changed to protect the innocent. On July 6th, trial was held in Superior Court, Department 86, City and County of Los Angeles, State of California. In a moment, the results of that trial. Now, here is our star, Jack Webb. Thank you. September. Fatima first made its famous money-back offer. Millions heard it, yet only 46 have written. October. Actual figures reported Fatima sales up 110% coast to coast, or more than double. November. Thousands more switching to Fatima. So why wait? Buy Fatima. Best of all, king-size cigarettes. And Mr. Dealer, that's your cue for November. This month, with Thanksgiving and the holidays coming up, I know you'll want to get your full share of all the new Fatima business. Check your Fatima stock tomorrow. 
Make sure you can take care of the thousands of Americans who are switching to Fatima, insisting on Fatima quality. The apprehension of the suspect, Jefferson Harold Allen, resulted in clearing 22 cases of burglaries committed over the past four months. Allen was indicted on 22 counts of first-degree burglary and received sentence as prescribed by law. First-degree burglary is punishable by imprisonment in the state penitentiary for not less than five years. Ladies and gentlemen, only 2.6 patients out of every hundred reaching the most forward hospitals in Korea died later. The comparable figure in World War II was 4.5. According to official medical statements, the almost miraculous success in saving the lives of casualties is owing in part to the prompt use of blood plasma on the battlefield and whole blood in military hospitals. Whole blood reduces shock, a potential killer, and replaces blood lost through bleeding. In the treatment of many battle casualties, there's no substitute for blood. Every American who has given blood can and should feel he personally has contributed directly to the saving of the life of an American boy. This month, your country is short 300,000 pints of blood. Please give your blood and save a life. You have just heard Dragnet, a series of authentic cases from official files. Technical advice comes from the Office of Chief of Police, W.H. Parker, Los Angeles Police Department. Fatima Cigarettes, best of all king-size cigarettes, has brought you Dragnet, transcribed from Los Angeles. Today's the silver anniversary of NBC.